Uh, one o'clock, so we're starting on time, which is very impressive. Um, so I'm really pleased to see so many people are, are logging in to this, this webinar on supporting people with learning disabilities to live longer, healthier lives. Um, we we'll just introduce ourselves to, to start with, and then we'll say a little bit about how the session's going to go. So my name is Emma Killick. I'm the Director of Adult Services with McIntyre. McIntyre is a learning disability charity. We support children and adults. The charity's been going for just over 50 years. Um, and we support quite a number of people who are growing older, as I have to say, am I and, and many of our staff. So this is a, an issue that's, that's quite dear to our hearts and, and a reason why I got involved with the guideline committee. And my colleague here. And hello, I'm Jenny Anderton. Um, I'm the transforming lead at Rotherham Borough Council. Um, and what's, as Emma said, we got involved in this. Uh, and what's really good is that we come from completely different backgrounds. So, um, I have a I have a background in the statutory uh, services, and I work. I was very fortunate to be able to work with the volume people team for six years. So that was really, really um, a privilege, really, to do that. Um, as Emma said, it's really good to see so many of you joining in with us today. And there is a, a chat box um, there for people to sign into and talk to, ask questions. But you need to remember that if you don't want to be known, you need to not use your name because everybody will be seeing you up there as the person that you are. So we're looking for, really looking forward to this next hour. And um, we know it's your lunch time, so we're going to try and give you 10 minutes for a sandwich at the end. So we're hoping to finish about 10 to 2. Um, so yeah, so let's start. So uh, okay. on we go. Yeah. So to kick off, um, and just to say that it's being recorded as well. So um, all of your comments will be there for posterity. I, that's great to see. Actually, There's a lot of people from Hampshire. So there you go. Hello, hello Hampshire, and, and North Yorkshire is sunny apparently, which is more than it is down here in London. So. Um, so just to give you then uh, an overview, so while we get into the, the swing of things. So in, in April of last year, NICE published, published the, these guidelines on the care and support of people growing older with learning disabilities. Now, that, that's the culmination of a, of a couple of years' um, work in terms of the guideline committee and much, much, much more work than, than that behind the scenes from colleagues at, at NICE and Sky. Um, and the guidelines provide evidence-based recommendations to support practice. Um, so we're going to explore some of those recommendations. For those of you who've used NICE guidelines before, you'll, you'll understand how, how they're laid out and how you can use them. But for those of you that, that have perhaps never really um, used NICE guidelines before or the supporting materials with them, we, we're going to try and demystify that a bit so that you can see how, how you could perhaps use it to support uh, your your work or, or indeed your family life. So we're going to talk through some of the examples and we're going to have a think about how some of those things might, might work in practice. And I suppose the, the thing like as Emma's just said we want to demystify it and my default setting is always go to the easy read because that you know sort of tells you most of what, what's in the guidance and, and, and how it becomes uh, available and accessible to everybody. Okay so we've got a few uh, slides that we're just going to talk through to set the scene um, and then it's going to be a little bit more interactive and uh, you know we'd, we'd love some some comments and feedback from you so so as I was saying the guideline committee we met for over two years and, and the group included people with learning disabilities uh, people had family carer um, backgrounds health and social care professionals there were commissioners there were providers academics researchers and an amazing team from from nice and sky supporting us and i suppose we really want to to give a, a you know a huge um thanks and recognition yeah. to nice and sky because these guidelines and the guidelines are around supporting people who have uh, behavior that challenges and that that's probably not the correct title but they, those two guidelines were being created in parallel um, and it was the first time that people with learning disabilities were actually an integral part of the guideline committee. And we all learned together as we went along. But I have to say the active involvement of, of our experts by experience changed the whole dynamic of that group and just made it so much more powerful because with the best will in the world, the, the emotion sometimes gets taken out of some of the things we're, we're so used to talking about. 
And so when we came to talk about things like health action planning, for example, that our colleagues on the on the committee were were very clear when they said to us, actually, this is this is about us, and this is about our friends and our family and our loved ones. So take this seriously, um, and that really 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 shines through in, in all of this. So I guess that's the message for all of us is, is work with people and involve people. But even if you, you you aren't quite sure how to do that to start with, just just feel your way through it. It'll it'll come good in the end. Um, so yeah, so the the guidelines are around people's changing needs, around planning for the future, delivering services, um, and and it covered health, social care, and housing. You know, family settings and professional settings. So it was massive, massive brief for the for the guideline to cover. Um, so okay, so. And as, as Sam has just said, I mean, the, the thing that, I suppose the theme that runs throughout all of this is, is it has to be person-centred and it has to be about her, hearing the person's voice and that we will labour that point as we go through this hour because that, you know, the people that were on our committee and worked with us were very clear about what, you know, us as professionals can say what we think is right, but they actually told us what was right and, you know, rightly stopped us from making decisions that, you know, they, they didn't agree with, so that was great. So there is an easy read version, as I've just said, and as I say, my default position is that that's the one to go to if, if, if you want to quick and, you know, have a quick look at it. Um, it was published in July. Um, the purpose of the guidance was to help commissioners, as Emma's just said, and it sets out in the sections the principles, the care, organisation, delivery care, identifying and assessing care, planning, reviewing, identifying, manage health needs, and end of life. And that was really important because sometimes we forget about that, we forget about end of life, and uh, for people with learning disabilities and their carers, it's something that's really quite hard for people to talk about. You know, it is for most people, but it, it seemed very, very uh, real to the people that were part of the, the committee yeah, about that, what, that, what yeah. you know, they found that quite difficult to talk about. Yeah, and the, the very last slide um, has got the links to the Easy yeah. Read version and to the quality standard and various other things. So to save you sort of searching on the on the NICE website, if you if you have these these slides, you can just click on the click on the link yeah. for those. Okay. Um, so I have to remember that I'm the person responsible for flicking the slides. <laughs> I have to remember to do that. Okay. You see, and that gets older as you get old, uh, that gets harder as you get older. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So so the guideline starts by by giving a context to this that people with learning disabilities have a poorer health profile than the general population, and I think we're all acutely aware of that. And of course, last week saw the the publication of the latest annual leader report, which. Mm. Um, it's a very detailed read, and, and if for those of you who haven't seen it, I would highly recommend that you do. It's very accessible, but it's it's very stark in the in the messages that it that it gives out. And one of the um, one of the the key things that we had lots and lots of discussion on in the guideline committee, and it's a question that still gets asked now, is what do we mean by older? You know what's that? What's that cut-off point? And it's very difficult, if not impossible, to say we are therefore talking about people who are aged over 50, over 40, over 35, because people are individual. Uh, people with learning disabilities may be affected earlier, particularly people with with certain syndromes or conditions. So we simply shied away from that. We didn't put any age bracket on this. Um, so one of the things we'd like to do, and, and this bit is anonymous, so don't worry, is, is we'd like to just have an understanding of the age range of the people who uh, you have joined us on this webinar. So according to my list, there are 46 participants, so we are curious to know the ages. Um, so we have a little poll, and we have a, we have a glamorous assistant <laughs> by the name of Steve, who is just um, queuing up this poll that will appear. So we just like if you could give us your age range. So are you under 30, uh, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, 60 to 69, 70 plus? So um, 
Jenny and I spanned the 50s and the 60s between us, but I'm not allowed to tell you which, which way round <laughs> that is. You can guess. You can guess. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so open it up and let's go. Oh, well done, everybody. Great. Oh, Look at that. Much. Fabulous. I'm just noticing down some of the questions while we're waiting for you to do that is that there's uh, Katie's worked in palliative care, end of life, and so that's really, really, um, you know, it's good that people are, uh, at, you know, working and, and understand this and can help spread the message. So that's really good to see. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, so I think is that our poll ended? So we'll come back to that later. Yeah. Be, it'll be um, fairly evident why we why we've asked those questions. But uh, okay, so the 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 guideline. Um, so there are a set of overarching principles because there are certain themes that just came up. It didn't matter what particular topic we were talking about. Uh, there were certain themes that came up. So. Um, access to services and person-centered care, you know, communicating and making information accessible, decision-making, mental capacity and consent, um, and involving people, family members, carers and advocates. Those themes came up time after time, and none of them are rocket science, and I'm sure we would all sign up to them, but they have to be restated, and we have to keep reminding ourselves of, of those things, because otherwise we just kind of get sucked into the the day-to-day -day and the activity and the tasks and, and it's easy to drift away from those things. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, so today we're going to explore the four topics in relation to some of the recommendations. So, you know, we keep coming back to this and, the, and the, it will be a theme throughout. It is about the person first, it's about listening to them, it's about listening to their family members and their carers and advocates and, and understanding what they're saying. It's not just about listening, it's about really understanding what they're saying to us because they are the experts. You know, the, these are the people that we support and work with and, and provide services and support for and those are the ones that will tell us whether we get this right or not. You know, we also then need to think about raising awareness of potential health needs because, as Emma's already said, people with learning disabilities, um, their, their health is, you know, sometimes neglected because there's a um, diagnostic overshadowing because they've got a learning disability. I mean, I, personally for me, I mean, I think about the fact that because uh, I've got a bad back, but when I go to the doctors or something, it's because I'm overweight, you know, so that gets overshadowed as to why the reason why you know, maybe I've got a bad back, and we um, and it's a, it's a real thing for people with learning disabilities that we put people in categories and say, oh, they've got a learning disability, so we miss out on things. So we need to raise that awareness of potential health needs. We've got to promote health and well-being because that keeps us all healthy. You know, and there's the importance of health checks, including the annual health check. And we, you know, there's a great debate about the annual health check and whether they're working, whether they're not working, you know, and we'll come back to that. So those, those are the four things we're going to cover today. Okay, so we're going to look at each of those areas in, uh, in a bit more detail. So, um, and we put a few images up here because we just need to keep reminding ourselves all the time that we're talking about people. Otherwise, we kind of get sucked into the words and the language and so forth. So, uh, try to find a few images to just just remind us that we're talking about people and their lives here. Um, and I see we've got a leader reviewer with us, so that's brilliant. I'm really pleased about that. Actually, that's really good because that's fantastic. Okay. So, in terms of involving people then and uh, family members and carers, so. So the quote there from the from the guideline is is health and care pr practitioners should listen to actively involve and value key members of the person's support network in the planning and delivery of their current and future care and support if the person agrees to this now that's fine isn't it i mean none of us would disagree with that that's fairly straightforward to write but there are a whole host of difficulties when we come to putting that into practice and what that looks like for us and I can you know see already that we've got people who are uh, care providers in various different settings we've got people who are from the commissioning team from health teams and so forth so and everybody has their own challenges to that and obviously people with a learning disability and their families and, and carers will have their own view on on all of this so we, we put a few questions there just to, just to kind of kickstart a bit of a discussion but obviously if people want to say anything that's uh, you know that's great please please do but um, from the point of view of who might be in someone's support network that the guidelines state 
all the people who provide emotional and practical help to a person with a learning disability. A person's support network could include their family, including siblings, friends, carers, advocates, non-family members living with the person in supported housing, and members of the person's religious community. So that's a huge long list. And and even saying the word family in this mm. day and age mm. is not straightforward yeah. because we immediately think of parents and then of course you've got siblings but you have wider family network you know some people will have cousins mm. aunts second cousins who will be hugely involved then of course we come into the complexity of the step family yeah. the foster family shared lives carers um, and we you know we can't make assumptions so an awful lot of people that i know who have a learning disability will have a spouse they may have a partner They've obviously got friends. It might be that some of the individuals that they're closest to might actually be work colleagues if they've got voluntary work or paid mm -hmm. employment mm -hmm. that they've had for a, for a period of time. I um, mean, you, you know, the, as I say, this is not an exclusive list. I mean, the, the, you know, the, 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 and again, it comes back to the person settingness of it. For some people, there'll be more there'll be people in their lives that are much more important than maybe their family or whatever to them and it's about their circle of support, it's about the people that mean something to them and bring something to their lives that we should include. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and then, you know, you've got care staff, health staff, you've also got another angle to possibly think about is people's landlords. If you've got somebody who has little or no uh, sort of care support input or family input but they but they have perhaps a housing association as their landlord it could very well be that their housing officer is somebody that they've had a long-standing relationship with so i guess the onus is on us to understand somebody and to understand those networks and to think think broadly about those networks and those networks will change over time um and then in terms of why why it might not always happen that the, the people are people are involved you get communication breakdowns don't we? we we know that you can have misunderstandings you can have people drifting apart you can have a, sadly a revolving door in terms of care professionals who are involved yeah. distances between uh, you know the individual and and where their family lives um, all of those things mm -hmm. can change over time people I mean, lose touch Emma and I were talking before about the fact that the, the, the environment that we're in at the minute is forever changing. So, you know, we talk about people that are important to people and building relationships with the people they work with or live with or whatever. And they, in this day and age, that constantly changes because as organisations we are restructuring or, you know, somebody's social worker might move on or something. And so building relationships is really really important but i think it's it's becoming even more challenging within within paid services for people to do that because of the, the transiting workforce that we've got absolutely so that i mean you know so that's one of the sort of common barriers that, that there is i think people can then sometimes get a little confused over capacity and mm. consent and and worry about what information yeah. can be shared with who and and how we go about doing that um but the essence in terms of how we might overcome those, I think the starting point for that is to place value on those relationships, to recognise them and to and to value them and, and to recognise somebody's life history. And I think if if you know somebody over a period of time, that's easier. But for mm -hmm. those of us who might come and go from a person's life at key points in time, to recognise them as somebody who has a past as well as a present and, mm. uh, and a future that you're planning is is quite a big ask if you're coming in with a busy workload to do a particular uh, particular um, you know activity with them at a point in time and of course building trust as well building trust with with everybody involved in that support network but the um, the people with a learning disability on the guideline committee were absolutely mm -hmm. clear, weren't they? Yeah. You know, you ask us, yeah. you involve our, our partners. Yeah. There's one gentleman saying, you, 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 you know, you involve me, you involve my wife. Um, so, and we can't, we can't not do that. So no. the onus is on that, on us to, to find ways to do that. And of course, as, uh, as the person is getting older, their support networks are changing. So their parents will be getting older um, at some point their parents are not going to be around they can be siblings they may get more involved they may not be so involved um, there's distances as we said people people come and go so 
I think when we were thinking about how m might we look to maintain people's involvement over time, as, as I said, placing value on those relationships and that life history is absolutely key. And I think some of the, you know, some of those very basic elements of person-centered planning that we are all very familiar with in terms of relationship mapping actually come back to the fore, that there are tools, there are ways of mm -hmm. us doing that, there are ways of ensuring that we value people's networks, we explore those networks, and that we measure relationships as part of the outcomes that we're looking at for people. Um, mm -hmm. and, and obviously making sure that, that we are all um, have a good understanding around capacity and around the Mental Capacity Act um, and those sorts of things, so that that is not a hindrance, that we don't not do something because we are, we are anxious about getting it wrong. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so the next um, the next topic we wanted to look at was about raising awareness of potential health needs, and th and this is, brings me back to talking about overshadowing and you know people um, just assuming that oh it's because the person's got a learning disability. But if we go back to the poll, and I'm just going to talk a bit about age related conditions. Okay, so if we go back to the poll and we look at the age range that people have joined us today. And if I just read some out, you, some of you will identify at the point in your life where these suddenly became an issue for you. So, blood pressure and cholesterol. You know, that, that happens, you know, as we get older, it becomes more, it becomes more, uh, more apparent. Um, I, 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 I put myself in the 60 to 69 bracket, That's but I would I say, you. but I would say from 50 onwards, the list of, you know, the list of um, age-related conditions got a bit longer for me. So thyroid, you know, talk about diabetes, he hearing loss and sight problems. Um, I readily forget people's names. Um, you know, and these are all age-related uh, conditions that happen to people on steady walking, lacking in confidence to undertake everyday tasks. These are things that happen to people we would term as normal. Okay, in that so. For a person with a learning disability, we have to be aware that they also are going to go through some of these things, you know, and it's about us being aware and looking and um, looking and making sure that we help them identify the fact that they, these are normal age-related um, illnesses that we need to make sure people get checked out. So we need to discuss with people the changes that they may occur with age um, and, and ask them about and monitor them for symptoms of common age related. So if people start to get a bit forgetful, if people start to not hear you sometimes, then that, is that about people saying, well, actually, it's, it, I need a hearing test. You know, we need to make sure that we look out for those things and don't just let them bypass people uh, because, you know, it, it, it's very easy to f forget that these, these um, age related conditions will affect pe everybody including us and including those people with a learning disability. Um, so, again, you know, we talk about what we need to know, understand, be aware of these age-related conditions. As we get older, we become more aware of them, and in some ways that helps us make sure that we think about that for other people. Um, and we need to make sure that we work on raising the awareness for each group. So, you know, we need to do that by talking to the person themselves, their family, their friends, their spouse, their employer, their care staff, their healthcare professionals, everybody that has um, everybody that has some um, input into that person's life needs to be looking out for these key triggers. Um, so we have to make sure that people learn disabilities in their families and friends have information that's relevant and that they can understand it. You know, how many times do we hear about people who learn disabilities getting a letter from their doctors asking them to cover, a, a, you know, a, 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 a normal screening? And it's not in a in a format that people can understand, and then people wonder why they don't turn up for the for the um, for the appointment. Mm. You know, so it's it, it's things like making sure that people's plans. You know, when we're working with people, that they, in their plans and their and their one page profiles, and that that's updated. That people recognise people are getting older, and that you know things are changing in that person's life. Um, and, you know, there's lots of barriers that we've talked about already that stop that happening, and that's diagnostic overshadowing. Attitudes that people don't need another label. They've already got a person with learning disabilities, got that label, so let's not give them another one. But actually, it's really important 
you know, if somebody's got diabetes or if somebody's, um, you know, got high cholesterol, we need to be just doing something about that. Um, and there is that, you know, we as a, we've talked about before about the fact that we're in a ever changing world. There is a reduction in preventative services, and you know, we have to try and try and make sure that people understand that they can't not include people with learning disabilities, even if they're you know trying to save a bit of money. You yeah. know, so it's a yeah, it's a tough one, really. I think I think the the awareness raising is key. So when we started to do a lot of work uh, around this within McIntyre, because we had this cohort of people who were um, who were sort of in the in the forty five to fifty five bracket when we when we looked at, at that, and what became really apparent to me, and I'd not thought about it before, was that I very rarely, if ever, heard people with a learning disability discussing amongst themselves age-related conditions and when I compare that to myself and my friends where there is a lot of talk about all my knees, all my eyes, all, all my whatever, my hair's going great, you know, those sorts of conversations that actually you might not think of as discussions about age-related conditions. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll freely admit I turned 50 last year I can tick off a lot of things on that list Not as many now. as me. <laughs> it's not a competition. Um, but I know what the future has in store for me because I have some wonderful friends <laughs> who are, you know, they're, they're, they're slightly older than I am and I, you know, I see them and I know what my future is. And, uh, you know, when I, uh, when I had to start wearing glasses at the age of 42, it not, did not come as a huge <laughs> surprise to me that now I have to wear distance glasses. And the optician said to me, well, 42 is the average age for, for ladies to, yeah. to need to start wearing glasses. I thought, well, that's nice. It's nice to be average. Um, but those conversations don't happen naturally, in mm. my experience, between people with a learning disability. So we have to create... Yeah. Quite intentionally, we have to create spaces and opportunities where those conversations can take place. And I think that's that's one of the challenges that we face. So one of the reasons for asking how, how old are you mm -hmm. is if you're 25 or 30 and you're supporting a lady or a gentleman who is, who is significantly older than you, how do you open up the opportunity for a conversation about maybe your knees hurt now and they didn't used to. Maybe you feel a little bit stiff when you're getting out of the chair and you didn't used to. Actually, maybe we should go and get your eyes tested even though you've never worn glasses before. And how would it actually occur to you that that might be what's going on? Mm. How would it occur to you that what you're seeing might be the signs of the, the menopause um, or, or, or that actually that gentleman is that age now so, so perhaps, um, you know, Sort of mm. having a conversation about the risks of testicular cancer or whatever. So I think that's one of the challenges for us is we don't want to overcomplicate things, we don't want to over medicalize things, but we have to have those sorts of conversations because otherwise suddenly out of the blue, without any context or scene setting, you're going to start talking to somebody about uh, you know the fact that they might develop diabetes. But you've you've done no scene setting around that at all in terms of the, the consequences of just mm. getting older, which is a natural part of life. I mean, the other thing, Bev, you raised a really good issue there about everybody thinking who owns the responsibility for linking up all the people involved in the person's life. And we had great debate about this. I mean, the committee and and since the committee, we've we've had great debate about you know who should be the person that does that, and also also about who who should be the person that brings together to make sure that the person has those health checks. Is you know who's going to take the lead in it and. I think it varies in in different places. So we we got we got a bit hung up in um, names, and we talked about learning disability liaison nurses. We talked about should it be social workers. We talked about should it be the person that's closest to the person. And I think it's different wherever you are and what where you will be. And that's not really helpful because there's no clear like guidance about what that should look like for people. But I think it's a really important point that you've raised because that's that's something that I think we all grapple with. Absolutely. Uh, just going back to, uh, I think Natasha asked about relationship mapping tools. On the on the slide, the final slide that yeah. I was referring to that has the links to the Easy Me document, there's also a link to a person-centred planning guidance document. Um, I mean, to be honest, if you go and look at any of the person-centred planning 
staff even even from sort of you know 10 15 years ago there will be relationship mapping mm. uh, tools and exercises in there um, so hopefully that if you clicked on that link that that would be of, of some help to you mm -hmm. so okay so that's about the potential health needs so now we've all had a glimpse of our future let's, <laughs> let's cheer ourselves up with uh, promoting some some health and health and well-being so um, okay so yeah, so there's a couple of um, couple of quotes here lifted from the uh, from the guideline. So, commissioners and service providers should provide opportunities for people with learning disabilities to meet up and socialise. Mm -hmm. So, social clubs, support groups, etc. And commissioners and service providers should ensure that there's a wide range of community-based physical activity programmes available. Um, and then it cites some examples. Now, they're just two of many many um, examples within the guidelines because actually this this isn't simply about let's look for the health conditions the things that are wrong the things that need fixing this is about actually promoting and celebrating somebody having a having a great life yeah. and and this is a message that i i picked up loud and clear from work that that we've been doing in mcintyre with the with the wider um, uh, dementia community, so we've been doing a lot of work around people with learning disabilities and dementia, and that's that's brought us into contact with people who do not have learning disabilities but who have a diagnosis of dementia, including people who are diagnosed quite quite young and quite early on, and they're very clear in their message of you know my life doesn't stop with that diagnosis or that suspected diagnosis. So I think that's you know that's absolutely key in that we have to promote health and well-being. We have to promote living life to the full, getting, uh, you know, getting absolutely the most from life that you can in terms of, in terms of what, what you want and, and need from that. So health and well-being covers all of those health conditions that we've just talked about and they are listed within the NICE guidelines. So if you want to go remind yourself again what, um, what nature has in store for you, you'll find it in the, in the guidelines listed loud and clear. But there are wider issues around, um, you know, lifestyle. So we've got healthy eating, exercise, relationships. Again, relationships, meaningful activities, your emotional well-being. We can't separate these these things out. Um, it's about. I mean, there's a lot of um, which is really good to see. There's a lot of stuff at the minute about people's mental health. You know, and it is about finding something the person likes to do, finding something that helps them, you know, with, with the everyday stresses of life and, and supporting them to do that. You know, people, the benefits of walking, the benefits of being outside, the benefits of talking to people, they're all things that you and I do all the time and it's making sure that people learn disabilities have that access as well and that we promote that for people. Yeah, and I think that's about being creative. Yeah. That's about thinking outside the box and thinking, well, why why can't we get involved with this? Why can't we try this? Um, why can't we think about how you make reasonable adjustments um, or, or, you know, getting people connected together? And, you know, again, on the sort of discussion points that we put there, we put, well, who needs to know or understand this? And the answer to that is, well, everybody, everybody does. Yeah. So the, the person themselves, their friends and family and all those people we talked about in terms of their support network, um, and the guideline references both learning disability and older people's services staff. Yeah. Oh, sorry, it's a very long-winded way of saying it because we, we can't simply assume that people growing older with a learning disability will be found in learning disability service land because not everybody is in pursuit of, of, of no. a, a service. And some people who are, actually they'll be being supported within older people's services and there is nothing wrong with that in and of itself providing that um, you know it's it's good quality person-centered support so so the issue is that there are an awful lot of people who need to be aware of these things and thinking about these things and um, one of the points that we put down there and I don't really know what the answer to this is because I'm sure I'm not the best role model at all but how do we bridge the gap between awareness and behavior so, i.e. what we know versus what we do. So we all know we should eat healthily. Does that mean we all do? We all know that we should exercise regularly. Does that mean we all do? And there is a huge difference, I think, if you've got people being supported um, yeah. by individuals, whether those, whether those staff know how to cook, whether those staff yeah. will encourage someone to walk to somewhere. And again, within the family, how the... Mm -hmm. 
you know, how the family um, approaches their life and whether they're fairly sort of active or, or sedentary. And it's, it, mm. you know, that's a challenge. But yeah. I think it's one, again, it's about awareness, it's about conversation, it's about opening up opportunities to talk about why it's important to get up and move around, why it's important to think about that healthy, balanced diet, um, why it's important to have conversations about poo and constipation mm. because we know we know that, that you know that ultimately that that has been the tragic cause of, of early death and unnecessary death for some individuals. So so there are things that we need to talk about. But that doesn't mean that we have to do it in a in a very sit down serious way if we if we open the opportunities for those conversations. And it's just like Emma said, it's about giving people choice, isn't it? It's about giving people choice, but making sure that people understand what their choices are and why they're choosing them. And I've just seen there that um, somebody's talked about inviting nurses into the day centre for parents, you know, and that, that for ge general check up, you know. So there's different ways of doing things, which is which is really really good. Um, it's about positive role modeling. It's about the leadership, isn't it? About organisations being clear about where they where they sit and what they want to do, uh, and modelling good practice. You know, so yeah, it is difficult for people to make this decision about shall I get the bus or shall I walk? You know, it's about working out sometimes what what is the right thing and how the right thing to do it. But it's about making sure people are informed and they understand what choice they're making. Um, so we're doing a pretty good whistle stop tour through the for, for, through some of the topics. Yeah, so we've we, we're covered to the most emotive one. We are yes. Yeah, we've talked cool. about involving people, family members, carers, advocates, raising awareness of potential health needs, promoting health and well-being. And now we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of health checks, including the annual health check. And I noticed somewhere before, and I. I was, Please apologise for not knowing the person's name because it's gone off the screen. But there was somebody that said that the health checks, um, you know, are variable. There's a couple of people talking about that, and absolutely they are. I mean, Emma was and I were talking before about the fact that, um, you know, health checks for some people are just a tick box exercise. And we spent quite a lot of time in the committee talking to the experts by experience, the people and their families, and they, they were telling us about their experience, and they were very clear that they don't want to have a health check if you're just going to sit and tick a box, you know, and, and, that, and that, that's what um, some people experience, and that, you know, it's yeah. not right. So, I mean, I have to say that, it, that that was the most emotionally charged discussion yeah. uh, around the annual health checks, and one of the difficulties for the, for the whole guideline committee is that there is not proper robust research evidence to yeah. show that annual health checks make a positive difference and that that was a really difficult mm -hmm. um, concept to get across to, to to the people on the committee that, that that directly affected because they said well why are you saying that our lives don't matter yeah. um, and uh, which I think kind of took all of our breath away it certainly we did. were absolutely yeah. not saying that yeah. at all but we were left with no doubt whatsoever that from their point of view annual health checks and other regular um, health checks and screening was really as, a, as, a, yeah, as absolute absolutely. fundamental human rights yeah. as far as they were concerned absolutely um, so. and you know and, and, and we and we talk about we talk about um, people and, and GPs that you know they get paid to do this there is, there is you know but some people do it and some don't it's about again about role modeling it's about you know offering the annual health check making sure that people understand what it is you know and making sure that the information around that is accessible to people it you know can we it, we write down what people's annual health check plan is and that we go back to it and we update it and you know, so we just we just need to keep doing that, and um, we need to make sure that people, as well as their annual health chat, have the same routine screening as everybody else does. So, if there's a cancer screening uh, thing, if there's breast screening, if there's you know, we need to make sure that people with learning disabilities are included in that. They get invited, they get the right information. The actually the health facilitators, the GPs, the nurses spend more time with people, and that is becoming ever more pressurised for people because austerity is here, you know, we talk about it but it, it sometimes becomes an excuse for people not to do the things that, that, that they need to do. Um, clear, accessible and practical information and advice for people is really, really important. Um, 
you know, and so it's, yeah, it was the most emotive thing, wasn't it, Emma? Absolutely. It was, absolutely. And, and what was interesting is that there were, there were health colleagues around the, yeah. uh, around the table as well, including somebody who was a GP, and, you know, they were obviously they you know, preaching to the converted, they absolutely know and understand how important they were, but we were still, you know, talking about the difficulties from a GP's perspective, uh, you know, with cancelled appointments or, or perhaps not really understanding how to make the reasonable adjustments or perhaps when somebody comes along that their information is incomplete because the person supporting them hasn't got the information to hand, etc. So I think the onus is upon all of us. Um, Yes, there is a very clear responsibility for GPs that, that, that they should do this, and, and actually there is a financial incentive for them to do this. But all of us, um, sort of indirectly involved, have a responsibility yeah. to make sure that this happens. And, and it was very clear that there needs to be a health action plan coming out of it, that yeah. something has to happen as a result of that annual health Absolutely. check. Otherwise, it's just lovely that it happened, but it yeah. needs to know. And somebody's asked a question about where it, where the health action plan sits. We had great debates about that. Yeah, real great absolutely. debates about where it sits. I mean, it should sit with the person, the GP, the practice. You know, it was really it, difficult to give it one place, wasn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. And I mean, I guess it's the you know the GP owns it in, in yeah. the sense that they're yeah. going to keep it on file there. It actually belongs to that individual. And if the individual can take charge of it and responsibility themselves, then that's fabulous. If they can't, then there will be people who have been commissioned yeah. to be responsible for that person's health. So, for example, if somebody is receiving social care support, you know, wrap around, then then that's part of what that contract says that care provider is responsible mm -hmm. for. Okay. So it'll be different versions of the plan, mm -hmm. but. Um, Katie, Katie uh, just raised a real important issue there about a huge gap in supporting people and disability to understand sexual health and grooming. Ooh, and and I, I, I totally agree what you're saying, Katie, the concentration is more on children with that. I mean, you know, it, it, it certainly is and that we need to think about how we do that better because um, you're right, absolutely. Absolutely, and I, th I think that um, we haven't really talked about sexuality and, 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 and sexual health, but that doesn't disappear just because nope. somebody's nope. Absolutely getting nope. older with a, nope. uh, with a learning disability. So those, and those are difficult conversations as well. Yeah. So if you think it's difficult to have a conversation about breast screening, yeah. well, yeah. let's have a conversation about sex, because that's even yeah. more uncomfortable for a lot of people. But we have to do that. And um, I don't know if people have seen that this is um, a bit irrelevant, but uh, it amused me anyway. Um, Age UK are having to do a whole load of work around um, awareness around sexual health in older people because of the numbers of older people who are, are you listening to this, Jenny? Right, who are, thank who are you. going back into the, <laughs> into, the, into the dating game, as it were. Um, and uh, yeah, there's an increase in sexually transmitted diseases and amongst older people so I just think that's great actually yeah. that, that, that that's 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 challenging so many uh, stereotypical views so what, so what's have... really good though is that people are talking about it now like Katie yeah. you've raised it you know that it's really good that it's on the agenda absolutely. because five you know a few years ago it wouldn't even have been something no, to think absolutely. about so that's absolutely. really really good that you've raised that Katie absolutely so yeah so it is about you know, as, and I, we will come back to the fact that the people on our committee were very, very clear that they did want a personal plan, you know, to help them stay healthy. It should detail what helped them to, they needed to look after their health. It, it was it was designed to support them to maintain their physical and mental health conditions. It was there, it was their plan. It wasn't, didn't, shouldn't be a tick box exercise. There had to be a follow up from it. There had to be you know the fact that if if um, one of the people talked about the fact that he you know he needed a hearing test he wanted it so that he would then have another hearing test in a year's time to see whether his hearing had improved or not and it's things that you and I can go to the GPs and say this is what we need to do for people learn disability yeah. sometimes they need some support to help to do that absolutely and I can see a comment there from from Bev about those crisis conversations mm. where older parents can no longer support yeah. older adults and then there's a transition into something that's actually an emergency placement and there was a lot of discussion about that yeah. round yeah. the round the table in the guideline committee and there were there were older carers there and there were people who had worked with older carers and they were saying you have to have these conversations as you go mm. along because otherwise 
when you get into the situation where it's a crisis, yeah. there is the best will in the world, there isn't the time for planning. What was really interesting as well was there's one person who was a committee member, uh, an expert by experience, who said very clearly at the beginning of our work, two years, you know, I don't want to talk about my end of life plan. Yeah. But by the end of the two years, she actually said, yeah. I know, now understand that I do need a, a, a plan for the rest of my life because it will be helpful for me and for the people around me. You know, so it is. they are difficult conversations, but we, we struggle with having them ourselves, don't we? But it, we need to make sure that doesn't happen because when it does become a crisis, then it's a double crisis for the person. Yeah, absolutely. So, And, you know, Rhiannon, you just put there at the bottom, you know, being involved in 10 crisis care situations, parents didn't want to think about it. Yeah. Yeah. We need to talk we about it. We all know why people don't want yeah. to think about it, but yeah. actually, yeah, we know that it's much more difficult mm. if we continue to put our head in the sand. Yeah. So, the, just the sort of final couple of slides, then, just to just to <clears throat> bring the conversation about the the, the guidelines to to a conclusion. So. Um, you know, after talking about those various different topics, the, the guideline then sort of pulls things back together again and reminds us of those those mm. themes, those golden threads that are running through. So, person-centred care and support, you know, keeps coming back. So keep coming back to that. It's person-centred, listening to the person, to the family carers, ensuring a well-trained and supported workforce. Now, now the the nice guidelines don't go into any detail about what we mean by training and well trained yeah. and I noticed yeah. that there were a couple of questions about how we do that and I think that there are, there's a wealth of material and resources out there that people can draw upon but for me the starting point is the awareness raising, yeah. the starting point is getting people to go actually do you know what yeah that's a thing, that is a topic, that is a thing, we need yeah. to think about that, we need to, to talk about that um, and there's also implications obviously for services that are commissioned, designed, how they how they work, etc. The key about that, the planning and, and designing of services and commission services, again, it comes back to the fact that to truly design and commission services that work for people, we have to ask the people what they want. Yes. And sometimes we get caught up in this thing about being professionals and we know best. You know, and something I've learned through my career is the people that are the professionals and are the are the people that know best are the people that actually at the, at the receiving end of what we commission yeah. so we have to be really really um, make sure they're included all the time okay so um, just to finish off then there's some general pointers for organizations putting the nice guidance into practice um, and these, you know, these are stuff that we've talked about, raising awareness, identifying these and champions, carrying out a baseline review, adopt an action plan and implement review. That's nothing that you won't know that you do all the time, but there's just, like Emma and I have said before, this isn't rocket science. No. It's, you know, it's about us being clear about what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how we're going to make it better. Okay, and it's not just about organisations, it's about us as individuals, because we are, we are the people that are the role models. You know, we are the champions, we are the people that people will think, well, if they're doing it, then maybe we should be doing it too. Okay. Okay, so just a, a sort of a little point to, to end on, because it can seem really daunting when you think yeah. about all those barriers and you read, you know, the leader report, and let's not mention Panorama, but, you know, it's all out there yeah. in terms of, of, of all this stuff that can just feel so overwhelming and, you know, these people aren't doing this and... and and so on and so forth. But actually, we've just put a, a quote up there from from Gandhi that you know you must be the change you mm -hmm. wish to see in the world. So so you can either feel really really daunted that there's all this stuff that you have no control over that makes life really difficult and prevents stuff, or you can go actually there is this thing this this one thing that I can go yeah. do. And there are there are fifty of us who've. Um, you know, giving up our, our lunch times to, to think about mm. this. So if all 50 of us just go off and do one thing differently, one new thing, that, that'll have a ripple effect. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Because you, we are the people that, you know, you can either be part of it or not be part of it. And um, people talk about this organisation does this or there's not enough money or that we never have enough staff. And we can keep saying that, but there is stuff that we can actually change. And make a difference to people's lives. Yeah, 
and, and it's great to see the, the comments coming up in the, in the chat box at the, at the yeah, side. So, great. I mean, you know, um, Elsie's making a, a point that you can have age related conversations and you could just say something like, you know, let's talk about our eyes. So, you don't have to label it as something no, that's yeah. going to yeah. switch, switch people off to start with. So, um, and, and yeah, there's obviously this whole sort of um, conversation going on around learning disability, sexual health, grooming, etc. We know that's a that's a massive, a massive concern for a lot of people, and it's just growing, isn't it? And that's before you get into the whole sort of online. Kind yeah. of thing but it, but it, again, I go back to the fact that at least people are talking about it now, yeah, whereas absolutely. they wouldn't have been before. You know, and um, it's coming up to ten to two. You know, so. Uh, we, I started this saying to him, I'm really nervous about it, but I think you've been a great bunch of people that have interacted with us really well. I've never done one of these before in my life, and I don't know if I'll do another one, but it's been really good talking to you this way. Yeah, no, Absolutely. It's, it, it's been great. I, I have no idea how many people would, no, it's would, great. Uh, would give up their time to join us, but yeah, 50 or Thank people you. is great. Thank you. So that's the final slide that I've just sort of keep referring to. So you can click on there for the links to the guidelines. To the quality standards now they're due to be published in in july, july yeah. so uh jenny and i enjoyed our time on the guideline committee so much we offered to get involved with the quality standards as well so, so it's you can blame us for them as well yeah um and then as i said there's a link to the person saying yeah. future planning but i see somebody's put a comment on there that there's loads of stuff from there helen is. sanderson and so yeah. forth so there'll be loads of stuff you can find there so thank you case, very much enjoy so, your sandwich yeah absolutely thank you